I would look at the, like the, the tribal people who had their own struggles very clearly. I mean, life in the jungle is not easy. It's a very hard, physically a very hard life. But one thing I noticed is that they were, they were much more content. I wouldn't say happy because happiness for me is a choice. Happiness is not a feeling. It's a choice, but they were very content in, in their life generally. And then I looked on here in the West and I realized that people have, I mean, we have here everything you could possibly imagine when it comes to luxury. We have hot running water. We have electricity 24 hours a day. Um, you know, we live a good life. So, but the people here are much less content. They're more aggressive almost, which is, which is even odd because you would think the tribal people have war. Yes. But I'm talking about with, with each other in, let's say, one community or one group or one tribe. They're much less aggressive. So what I did is I decided to take both societies and strip everything away, strip away the luxury, strip away everything materialistic from both sides. Okay. And then you look at the two groups and I looked at them and I said, well, what, what is left? Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Going Out, Looking In, the podcast about the big questions of life, personal growth and spirituality. My name is Maxi, I'm your host and today I'm going to take you on a journey into the jungle. What I mean by that I'm going to be elaborating on in a second but before I do so I just wanted to take a brief moment to say thank you. Thank you for 2023. My first year of podcasting with all the ups and downs, all the learnings, all the beautiful things that happened, all the roadblocks that I hit and your ongoing support. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the feedback. I'm looking at the messages. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm looking at physical presence that I'm holding in my hands under my Christmas tree of you listeners and all of that means so much to me and it's something that I never actually even imagined when starting this journey. I started this as somewhat of like an audio diary more I don't know for me as some sort of like taking self inventory you know going out looking in that kind of stuff and it turned into an interview podcast and here I am you know continuously learning and hopefully growing and evolving to the best of my abilities, you know, how to hold space, how to conduct these interviews, how to ask questions, how to listen, how to, you know, know when to speak and when not, Um, how to facilitate an environment where people feel at home and safe and secure to share their truths and to express what they feel like our world needs more of. And that has been just personally uh, an enormous journey and still is and i'm yeah devoted and i'm committed to bring you even yeah even even more powerful episodes and the best possible amount of content that i can that i can that i can create so i'm committed i just wanted to take yeah the moment say thank you for that support I have amazing interviews lined up so you can, yeah, you can be, you can be excited. Make sure to follow and stick with me. That's it. Yeah. And you know that you are gifting me your attention. That's all you have on this planet, right? We can focus on one thing at a time um, and you decide to sometimes click on a button and it says play on going out, looking in and you gift me your attention and that is damn valuable. So thank you. Right. With that being said, I said I'm going to take you onto a journey into the jungle. And what I mean by that is I'm taking you on the journey of Sabine Kugler. Sabine is a German author of the book Jungle Kid, which is the foundation of the movie Jungle Kid, which was published in 2011. And she's also the author of the just recently published book. I no longer swim where the crocodiles are. All of her books are part of the story of her life, of her childhood growing up in the jungle, in the deep, deep, deep jungle, far away from any civilization among the Fayu tribe, where she was raised from age of seven to seven 
team. Sabine was going on that trip with her parents who were missionaries to study and learn the culture of the Fayu tribe and un until then completely unknown tribe in the jungle of West Papua in Indonesia. Um, Sabine learned the language, she learned the ways of the Fayu, she learned to hunt, she learned to read the signs and the language of the forest and to become one with the elements. At the age of 17, she returned to the Western society, became a mom of four and wrote quite a few books, which became enormously successful. Because yes, the reintegration into our world as we know it, coming from a place that is so, so, so different, as you can imagine, is not easy at all. And is something that Sabine is still grappling with and still wrestling with. And she talks about it in a beautiful, reflected and vivid way that takes us all on a journey into a completely different culture where different values and different, yeah, different things are just important and essential to survive. And I've learned personally so much, especially um, from her second part um, of her life, where life and, and yeah, and, and her journey took an unexpected turn. That is because in 2012, Sabine got severely sick and went from hospital and Western doctor to Western doctor. Um, she also tried alternative um, healing modalities such as traditional Chinese medicine and Buddhist medicine and unfortunately all without success. So with her health um, more and more declining um, and heading towards a very bad place, potentially her death, she decided to make the most difficult decision of her life meaning to leave her four children behind, to embark on a journey back to the jungle, back to where it all started, back to her roots, to heal and find a cure for her illness. She was back in the jungle for five years, going from shaman and medicine man to shaman and medicine man from one tribe, tribe to another, to finally find a shaman who was able to extract the juice out of a tree that was acting as a as a medicine that eventually uh, healed Sabine entirely. She then went back to Germany, wrote her, her book, I No Longer Swim Where the Crocodiles Are, about this particular part of her journey, about her recovery and about her reintegration into, into Germany after everything that happened and yeah. If that is not enough reason for you to be super excited, I don't know what is. I was, from the first moment that I discovered and heard of that, of, of that story, I was hooked and I was excited to investigate with, with Sabine the differences and the similarities maybe also um, of the, these completely different lifestyles and cultures and what we can learn from each other, you know? What can we learn from people who are deeply immersed in nature, who are living in harmony with them? Um, what can we as Westerners learn from that? But also, what can people in the jungle learn maybe from us, you know? Because I really found that in that conversation. There is no right and wrong. There is no good and bad and better and worse. It's just different. And um, to elaborate on that and what that actually means, we're gonna be speaking about that. Um, so many different challenges that Sabine had to overcome to where she is right now um, and much, much more. So I couldn't be more excited to start the new year with this kind of episode and with such a powerful guest and beautiful, powerful um, woman as, as well. Yeah, so very, very inspiring and deeply grateful to have had this opportunity to speak to Sabine. Wish you beautiful insights as always. Much love from my heart to yours. And this episode with Sabine Kugler. Uh, 
on this glorious day. I just would like to start with uh, what's alive within you today? Tired, honestly. Yeah, mm. tired. It's been a long weeks of, yeah, a lot going on, a lot of traveling, moving. So I'm actually really looking forward for the next two, three weeks. Honestly, I'm, I'm good. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited to see family. It's mm. always a nice time of the year. So, yeah. right. Good. So, how do, you, how do you start your mornings? Oh, coffee. I'm a coffee <laughs> junkie. <laughs> I love coffee. And I'm one of those few, few people who can actually drink coffee and still sleep. So, like, I don't know anybody else who gets up at night to drink coffee and goes right back to sleep again. So, yeah, I try to not drink too much, but I'm a total coffee person and I always like to start my day very slow. I don't like rushing. I don't like jumping up and rushing in the shower because then I feel like the day doesn't start. So I always get a coffee first and read stuff and just slowly give myself time to wake up properly. Mm. I like slow mornings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. There's a specific energy. I feel like that as well. Especially early in the morning, rising with the sun. Um, yes. I mean, you will know all about it. Um, yeah, did that, did that, I mean, obviously it changed throughout the years now for you being more into, you know, in, 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 in this hemisphere here and in this, in these coordinates here in the Western, in the Western world. Um, but how, how does your, how, how do your mornings differ from when you were rising in the jungle? Very different. First of all, um, you get up when the sun gets up and you don't stay in bed and because the beds are generally, you know, just a floor or mat or leaves or whatever, or you know, thin mattress or whatever. So the sleeping in or staying in bed, just not that big of a thing there. So generally I'm much more active in the morning there. So I get up and then I go looking for hot water. That was always my thing. Everybody in, in the villages where I was or in the tribes, they always laughed because the first thing I did is go around looking for hot water. If I could, or, you know, there was a time I didn't drink coffee. So I was drinking like um, lemongrass tea, which mm -hmm. is actually really good, like fresh lemongrass tree. So I'd go collect lemongrass and then go look for hot water. <laughs> that was usually my mornings. So, yeah, so very different from here. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, we can we can go so many ways here with this with this conversation. Um, I feel like you know you you you've talked about the story and the cr the chronology of of it and how it started and everything. And and I feel like you know this is like really also a lot of that people um, can read about. But I'm very I'm very interested in 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 just you and how also like what you extracted from it what did it, what did all of this really do with with you as as a human being and not a human doing as we you know we are tend to do here in the west you know we're always running around and you know we apparently need to do something um mm -hmm. so i guess i would just love to start with um i mean we can go a little bit chronological um just by um the first sort of um the, the first memories that you have um of arriving in the jungle and 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 getting acclimated with with the you know everything outside and inside um how how was that like for you and also your family and then how how did that evolve over the years um to when you then come came back Well, I remember before we even went into the jungle, um, I was five, I believe, when we arrived in West Papua, Indonesia, and we were staying in close to the capital, Jayapura, which is not a capital like you imagine here. It's like a capital at the time there was like one road with lots of holes and it was still a very, very simple, small town, I would say. And we were staying at a guest house and it was the first morning I woke up there. And I, this is a memory I will re Just It's so embedded in my brain. I could smell and feel it to this day. And I woke up and I was laying in this bed and I looked in front of me and there were these windows with these glass panels. It wasn't like we have one big glass panels. There were those who are in Australia and other parts of the world don't know what I'm talking about. There were glass panels like in layers and then you could like turn them to yep. open and close them. So... And I remember looking out and the sun was shining and I could smell the air. I could feel the warmth. 
And this thought came through my mind that I am happy. I had this incredible feeling of happiness. And somehow I thought to myself, this is a place that I really love. And that's the way it turned out to be. And it was a memory, I'll never forget, it was the first memory I had of West Papua when I woke up that one morning. Mm. So then, of course, we stayed in the capital for a while, and then we ended up moving to a jungle base, which, of course, for me was very exciting. So my early memories are filled with adventures, like for me, like coming in, it's like coming into a magical world. That's the way I saw it as a child, uh, coming into a world that was filled with smells and colors and and adventures, and I was very excited. I was very excited, yes. Right. How it was for the rest of my family, I don't know. I think my parents, of course, they were, you know, adults, so they were dealing with other stuff. But as kids, we were very carefree. So, yeah, so that was like my first memories of arriving uh, in West Papua at the time, before we went into the jungle. Right. Yeah, as you say, I can imagine it being quite different for your parents. And you, you yeah. were speaking on this um, a few times, you know, also saying, you know, that your actually some common misconception is that, you know, your dad, you know, didn't know what he was doing, but he knew exactly what he was doing. Or he was at least like prepared, you know, and he was, yeah. he, you know, he, he went in and he studied, I think you said a, a year prior to entering, he, he studied the tribe already and he, he was, you know, educating himself about like the ways of, of navigating this territory is that... Would that be accurate to say that? Yeah, well, he, he went in. First of all, my parents were trained before that even how to deal with situations like that. So it wasn't like someone who had no experience. They had been working in Nepal prior to that in right. the Himalayan mountains. So right. they were experienced in working with people who didn't have much contact to the outside world. And, of course, this was even extremer. But before he brought us as a family to the tribe, he actually spent about eight or nine months there learning the language, language, learning the culture, making sure that there was like what their laws were, what their system was, because every tribe has their own system. Okay. So before we came in, he obviously spent time there in order to be able to find out exactly how to navigate uh, life there. And that's always very, very important. So it wasn't like he just took us and took us in right away and he didn't know what he was doing. So yeah, so he did, he did a lot of preparation before we came in. Right. So you were mentioning, and I find that I, I find that very fascinating, and it resonates deeply within me, is that you said something along the lines of like, there is things that these people in the in the jungle, these tribes, they will, you know, and we can look at a person, all right, uh, and you know, you, you we talk about it many times, you know, when it comes to skin color or you know the, the, the appearance right the the immediate appearance of somebody all right we can pick up on that and we can maybe notice a difference or a similarity but all right that's that but then there is so much more right and so and and and, and you were sharing about you know that the these tribes they have a sensitivity towards other humans where they obviously then later on also identify you as some of there, you know, some of like of the tribe, you know, you were part of it and you were integrated. And so I would love to have you, you know, elaborate a little bit on what what exactly are you referring to there when when you say, you know, they pick up on, is it energies? Is it like an aura? Is it? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you can share yeah, well a little bit. Yeah, well, the, most of the time in the West, we, we communicate mostly with words and with expressions. Right. Mimic, ge gestures. But the tribal people have one layer further when they communicate, and that's what they, they can sense things. So if I'm sitting across from someone and I say to them, you know, could you please uh, do this and this for me? Even if he says yes, I can sense what he exactly what he means. So even if it says yes, because try and generally in tribal customs, it's not that it's not very polite to say no. So they'll say something, but it doesn't matter what they say because they automatically assume that you know exactly what he or she means. So if I say something to someone and he answers me, then I know exactly just by sensing it if he, if he would do it or not. So if I sense he's not going to do it, I drop it. 
But someone coming in from the West can't do that, so they'll go on it again or they expect something. And then the tribal people get very angry because they're like, well, didn't I tell them no? Because they have a different form of communication. Now, they can sense when other people can communicate like that. And it has to do with, it, it's not telepathical, it's not, but it's similar to that. So they can sense other people's emotions, feelings, thoughts. But in sensing something, you also have to be able to translate it. It's like mm -hmm. a language you learn. So for example, they, oftentimes you'll have people coming in from the outside and they sense something on this person, but they don't quite know how to translate it correctly. So you have a lot of misunderstandings alone on that, on that level. But this form of communication is something that I didn't even realize I had because everyone had it. So I thought, well, everyone can sense what I'm feeling. Everyone will know automatically what I mean when I say something. And that was one of the biggest challenges I faced when I returned to the West. A question that came up for me is um, just that, so you were just sharing that your dad, prior to bringing your whole family into the tribe and into that territory, he went ahead and, and you know, got accustomed and, and, and learned the language and everything. Um, but you shared that basically in order to really learn the ways of the jungle, you need to be somewhat born there or be there in your childhood to really, you know, learn the ways and, and feel it. And it's hard for adults to pick up on all of the nuanced ways of being and all of the senses that need to be developed in order to, you know, be an integral part of the community. So, um, I mean, when you first entered, you were a child, so you were very yeah. young. But how was it yeah. for your how was it for your parents? And um, so, and also for you as a child, like were you basically integrated straight away, or was it like a gradual process? No, it was a gradual process. I mean, anywhere you go into, they're in the beginning a bit distant. Mm -hmm. So, but children are very adaptable. It doesn't matter in what culture. So, with the children, it took it didn't take that long. And children are much more open. They're much more willing to accept someone. They're not, they're not judgmental. They don't, children are much more accepting on differences. So when we came in in the beginning, the children for, because of the war situation in the tribe, they, they didn't even know that it was, they didn't even know what playing was because they'd never, they grew up not even knowing that it was possible to play. So they would watch us. And after a while, they, approached us and they began to learn to play with us. So the childhood, the early childhood days were spent pretty much playing with them. I mean, it was imagine for a child like myself who always loved adventures, having like this huge playground of hundreds of miles just in front of my door with like an open zoo with animals and insects and spiders. And, and so for me, it was like an incredible adventure every day. And I think they picked that up also from my love for the nature. And so we spent a lot of time playing with nature, so to say. So, yeah, so they were, they were open and eventually it took time. It, I think it took, it took a number of years before we were really completely integrated as children. For my parents, I don't really know. I never asked them, but they felt very comfortable there. My, my, especially my father, he loved the fire. He loved life there. He was very passionate about it. And I think they were also very busy just surviving there because, I mean, we're talking about an area that's very, very deep in the swamps and mm -hmm. it is not easy to live there as an adult. As a child, I don't, I don't remember being hurt, but I'm sure as an adult, it wasn't easy. So I don't really know, but we children got integrated very quickly. Yes. So mm -hmm. what was Period the, time. what was the logistical setup like? And what was the expectation of also like the organization that your father worked for? How basically, you know, how do I have to imagine that? So basically, you know, that was it basically sort of expected that you adapted the way of the Fayu in that case and the tribe that you were living with? Like, was that sort of like expected? And also because you are somewhat dependent on, learning their ways of for example hunting in order to have food or was there like a supply chain of 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 um resources coming in you know helping and supporting you or were you completely like off grid and remote shut off from all sorts of like you know society basically no not at all there, there was a complete system set up 
Okay. So we did have, when we came to the village, we always had like bags of rice, uh, mm. you know, like bags of food with us. We had canned food with us because there's not, it's contrary to what many people believe, the, the swamp area does not have a lot of food because we're talking about large areas that are just swamps. So food was oftentimes limited. We did have a garden which we planted and we were able to get vegetables and the people, we did a trade system where they would bring us food, but food was very, there wasn't a lot of it. There was sago maybe, and they didn't go hunting every day or every week, maybe once a month. So hunting was mostly, if we had meat, it was smaller animals, uh, ostrich eggs, um, snake, crocodiles, fish. Uh, they ate lizards, they ate everything. They, you know, everything they caught, they ate. So we didn't eat everything, but there was a system set up where we had a short ham radio and mm-hmm. then we would have to, at a specific time, we would just call in to make sure everything was okay. So the system is, is if you don't answer, like within two, three days, they'll send out a helicopter or a plane to check on you. So there was a security set up. If there was an emergency, there was always an emergency helicopter on standby to pick us up if anything happened. So it wasn't that we were completely out there and we had no chance of getting help, which actually was at one point, we did have to call them. My first book, I write about it, where we had to call in the helicopter because we got very, very sick. Right. But that was just one time. So yeah, so we did have a system set up and we would, every few months or every, yeah, every few months we would leave the fire territory. We'd go to the jungle base where we would replenish all our food and get everything we needed. And so it wasn't, it wasn't like we were completely cut off from everything. Right. And how was that for the Fayu tribe? Did they, so for example, like, I don't know, I, something very s- trivial or like as simple as a yeah bag of rice or something, which is still sort of like fabricated and sort of even the packaging, you know, is, <laughs> is something that is, you know, foreign for people who have not been in touch with any sort of civilization. How did they react to all of these man-made or machine-made things that you introduced them to? Well, rice, so much, not so much. They weren't that interested in. They were more interested in the bags that the rice came into. Uh, they were interested in in any form that could hold water because they didn't have any cups or anything. I mean, you imagine oh, if yeah. they were thirsty, they had to go to the river. But what if you're out in the jungle and you're thirsty? So for them, the value of the of the containers had more was was for them more important than the food itself. So it's like, for example, we used up rice, they would want the bag because they could store stuff in it. So that that they really that they really liked. But as for the food, um there were some foods they didn't like at all. Uh there was one story where my mom, you know, we don't get much food out there. I mean our food was like canned food, mostly from China. So or Indonesia. So one time someone had sent us raisins from I think it's from Germany. I mean the, the I mean that these raisins you have to imagine they took the plane, this is like in the eighties, all the way to West Papua, and then they had to be put onto a small plane, brought to the jungle base, and then they had to be brought with a helicopter. So yeah. these raisins took an incredible long journey. <laughs> and my mom was so excited. So she made she made um pancakes, like well, the jungle from a pancake. She put the raisins in it and she wanted to give it to the women because she thought they would really appreciate it. And right. so when she went out, they had picked out all the raisins and they were laying on the floor. And so she said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we don't eat bugs that we don't know. <laughs> so so there goes. So the, my mom, I remember that she was very sad. So the pigs came and they ate up all the raisins on the floor. But, you know, we don't eat, anim- we don't eat bugs that we don't know was like one of the jokes that we had for many years. Mm. But, uh, yeah. But generally, you know, generally they have, they, they, They were hunters and gatherers, so they would gather most of the food they ate. Uh, sometimes, though, my dad would cook food for them, like a big pot of food, and they loved it. Obviously, they they loved this new food, but it was mostly to do with like when we realized when we noticed that they were starting to get in fights with each other, and then there was always the situation that they could break out into a war. One thing we discovered is that when when humans are full, they're much less like less likely to fight. Mm. So, so we would come up with these methods to try to de-escalate the situation. And my dad would cook, or my, you know, they cook like a big pot of rice and something to it, and then they would go out and give it to the people. And within like fifteen twenty minutes, everything was quiet again. So, yeah. So that was we used that often to to yeah to bring a bit more yeah to de-escalate any stress or any any fights that were starting to form among them. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't, you know. 
<laughs> that that would be comedic gold for any stand-up co uh, uh, a comedian because basically yeah. you know that's what you in some ways or another you you notice that in supermarkets on a small scale you know that's all you, also why you say you don't don't go grocery shopping when you're hungry because you're just yeah. like you know you eat that yeah, yeah that's true you, you, you know you <laughs> buy just buy more, more and you're more <laughs> impulsive and you're just a little bit you know that's hangry true. you know you're hangry yes yes yeah and and short-tempered And irritated. There's this, this, there's this, there's, there's someone who told me once, who was, she was a marriage therapist, and she told me of a client she had that barely, if, rarely ever fought, very successful marriage. And she asked them once what they do. And they said that every time they start getting into a fight, they stop and they go eat. And then they decide <laughs> if they should continue to fight. And they said, it's amazing how many times the fighting would stop because they realized they were hungry. So I never forgot that. I just thought that was really amusing. So for those out there listening to this podcast, <laughs> if you're married, if you do have a fight with your partner, go get something to eat, go make cook something, go to the restaurant, order something, and then see if you want to fight after that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's very interesting also from a sort of, you know, like, like on a deeper level, like if you're just nourished, like inside and out what that you know and we see that also in society play out when people are not nourished inside as well emotionally spiritually mentally um how that plays out in relationship in any form of interaction you know you are more you, you know you, you're entering a space of dependency and transaction you know because you need something from the outside actually it's a perfect segue into something that i wanted to ask you anyway which is that you um that you which is something i think like many of us especially and i know it's many of my listeners we you know we're trying to achieve um fulfillment inner inner fulfillment just Or contentment, I would say, maybe, you know, with everything that life brings, you know, the ups and downs and all of that. But finding contentment with that and being present, finding, yeah, just feeling okay with what is, you know. And I feel like, you know, the big truths are always very simple. So, you know, can I just be content and happy with what is? And now I've listened to a little bit of interviews with you and that's what you share. You know, you said like you, you learned to be happy with what is and, yes. and, um, and where you are as well, you know, because there's a lot of people asking you, you know, like, where do you belong? You know, is it there or is it here? You know, what's better, mm -hmm. you know, and all of that. And you're like, ah, oh, well, you know, I'm just fine with where I am right now, you know, and I've learned that. So the questions of questions that I want to ask you is like, How did you learn that? Because I know so many people who want to live like that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's it, it's true. It's like so, oftentimes it's the small things or the simple things that we tend to miss. But one thing I I, re I recognized, um, especially coming going from one extreme culture to the other, I I would look at them and I would like, I mean, I would look at the like the the tribal people who had their own struggles very clearly. I mean, life in the jungle is not easy. It's a very hard, physically a very hard life. But one thing I noticed is that they were, they were much more content. I wouldn't say happy because happiness for me is a choice. Happiness is not a feeling. It's a choice, but they were very content in, in their life generally. And then I looked on here in the West and I realized that people have, I mean, we have here everything you could possibly imagine when it comes to luxury. We have hot running water. We have electricity 24 hours a day. Um, you know, we live a good life. So, but the people here are much less content. They're more aggressive almost, which is, which is even odd because you would think the tribal people have war. Yes. But I'm talking about with, with each other in, let's say, one community or one group or one tribe. They're much less aggressive. So what I did is I decided to take both societies and strip everything away, strip away the luxury, strip away everything materialistic from both sides. Okay. And then you look at the two groups and I looked at them and I said, well, what, what is left? And so when I looked at the tribal people, the system, the tribal people or village people, I realized that they were much more, there was much more unity amongst themselves. They were a society which bases their life very much on society itself, on being together, 
on the social events that happen within the tribe, social events. They spent a lot more time with each other. They talked a lot more. They were much less judgmental. They they were much less critical. They gossiped too. Don't get me wrong. They gossiped. They loved gossiping, but it it was different. Then if you take this society and you take strip everything away that's materialistic, what you have left is, when I look at these people, there's so much loneliness. There's so much fear. There's so much struggling. And, and we live, it, it's like we're in, a, in this incredible race here. We're, we're running, we're running, and we're trying to run towards something, but nobody really knows what we're running for. We're, you know, we're tired, we're exhausted, we're trying to continually, you know, survive in this world. But the question is, what are we running for? What are we trying to achieve? And we're so busy looking ahead, looking in front, looking, oh, I got to reach this goal, I got to reach this goal, I got to achieve this, that we tend to forget that which is right in front of us, which is society, social life, which is, you know, the people around you, your friends, your family, your 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 social activities. And and I began to understand that contentment or happiness or security doesn't come from how much is in your bank account. I mean, hey, who doesn't want a lot on their bank account? But, you know, it's not that because you can lose it tomorrow. You can lose everything you have tomorrow. So what is it that gives us stability within ourselves, emotionally, mentally? And for me, it's the people that you have around you. It's here in the West, I would say it's a mini tribe of your friends and family. In the jungle, of course, they have a bigger tribe. So that was something that I was always found. And also in the West, we... We are very much focused on ourselves. We're very, very, you know, this is why we've developed as much as we have, because we have a lot of more freedom here in personal development. But we're very focused on what our needs are, what we need are, sorry, what we feel, what is important for, you know, it's a very me society, which is one extreme. Then you have the other extreme, which is a very other person society, which is also not the best solution. So I always think we should find a good balance between taking care of ourselves, which is very important, but also taking care of those around us and not doing it because we expect something in return, but because giving, I think, gives it's, giving is a wonderful thing to do. And it, it, it brings a lot of pleasure if you do it right. So that's one of the things that I learned when I came back here, because I suddenly, you know, coming from a world where Things were very quiet. There was nobody was running, nobody was rushing, nobody was stressed. And then coming back here was really hard because it's like you're thrown back into this race of rushing and running. And I began to notice that I began to pick up the same things as everybody else that I was thinking about what's going to happen next month or year after that. And it was stressing me out and weighing me down. So I had to stop right there and say, okay, I need to focus on today. I need to focus on the food I'm eating. I'm at a restaurant. I Focus on the food, the taste, what I'm enjoying at that moment. I focus on someone that I'm talking to. I look at them. I listen to the words. I try to understand what they're saying. So I focus on the moment. And that really, really helped me become much more calm in a world that is, for me, very chaotic. Mm. Yeah, something that comes to heart and mind uh, when you are sharing that is that I feel like it's sort of like even contraintuitive for us Westerners to be mindful and to be aware of the moment in front of us because the conditioning that we experience basically spoon feds us uh, or like requires us to act in a like to act in a different way or to act the way that we are acting which is you know to be very maybe also guarded in some way from the present moment because there is so much coming in that if we let everything in all the way you know we would just be constantly overwhelmed so basically you stay on this sort of like level of superficiality and sort of like in your own cocoon, you know, um, because otherwise you would just go absolutely crazy. Um, and at the same time, and that, that's something actually that really came to me when I was um, preparing for this interview and I was reading um, your, your, um, your books and I was like reading your story and stuff. It's just like 
um, like the conclusion of like saying, you know, and 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 and. Uh, and saying, you know, this, you know, the Western world is worse, which is often the narrative, right? So everything Western is bad and it's worse and we are just like, you mm -hmm. know, we are just, I don't know, we're just doing things wrong and we should all do it. You know, we should all learn from how we, you know, how people, for example, like the tribes were doing it and stuff. And this is better, like to, to, to give names and to say that this is that and this is that. It's just like, like you say, If you were to come from one society and you were placed in the other, you know, completely different skills are required. And if yeah. you apply the same ones, you would just drown hopelessly because as you describe so vividly with hunting and all of the skills you develop in the jungle, you come here and you you cannot really participate and function because your senses are developed in a whole different area, you know, which are not really needed in, in, in this world here or not, not, not to the same degree as they were in the jungle and vice versa. So there's like other qualities that we develop here in the West that when, you know, when we would go to the jungle are not of any use there. So it's like, I, don't, I feel like there's a lot of like immediate jumping to conclusions and saying, you know, this is good and this is bad. Although it's just different is, is I don't know. I, I would be curious to hear your feelings and thoughts on that. Yes. Well, you have to differentiate between daily life and interaction with others, because it doesn't matter where we are, where we grow up, what society we live. Humans are humans. Emotions are emotions. Every human needs love. Every human needs attention. Every human, we have all the basic needs. Just because someone lives in the jungle doesn't mean they're different than us. So we have a situation with where there are two extremes. And one of the things that I was taught very early on is that everything needs a balance. And everything that is too extreme, every time something comes out of balance, chaos comes from that. Now, the Fayu had one extreme. They had no past and no future. That means they only lived in the present, which is for, you know, nice in some ways. But what, the, what happens is the culture will die out, which ha which almost happened. You as a society, if you live only in the present, never, you know, learning from the past and planning for the future, you eventually the society or the culture will die out. So that's one extreme. Then you have the other extreme of societies that are only focused on the future. So what happens if you're only focused on the future, a lot of important aspects of, of, you know, of interaction, of, uh, of learning a bit to, to focus on the moment. If, if you go on that one, you end up with a society that's also, I wouldn't say falling apart, but that's also very lonely and struggling in, in many ways. Now that on that level, yes, there are other things. And this is what I always say. There is no perfect world. Neither here nor there. Now, when I'm in the jungle, what do I tell the people? You guys need to learn to plan better. You guys need to learn to think ahead better. You know, so it depends on what society you're in. I tell them, listen, you know, you got to think, because there's this phenomena that I, I came across when I used to go, when we used to go from village to village, we would help them with their gardens. All right. So we had five villages next to each other. So one village decided one day to plant watermelons. And they had, you know, good success with the watermelons. So the next season... All five villages planted watermelons. So what happens? There were too many watermelons, so the, <laughs> so the price dropped. So the next season, everybody said, okay, let's all plant peanuts. So they would all plant peanuts. So they would do whatever the next person is doing. They would do the same thing. So we came in and said, no, no, no. One village should plant watermelons. The other one should plant peanuts for selling. The other one should plant greens. But it was so hard for them to, 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 Yeah, to have that concept of saying, let's plant everybody something else, which is individualism, which would be good for them. So these are things that, for example, I tell them when I'm there. I said, you guys need to learn to be a bit more, you know, thinking ahead of, okay, if everybody plants watermelons, your price is not going to be good for the watermelons. So <clears throat> both societies have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, <clears throat> and one, one thing is clear when it comes to the materialistic aspects, when it comes to comfort, when it comes to Uh, care, medical care. We are, of course, in the West way, way, way more advanced, way more advanced and educational wise too. But what I notice often is that when I do spend time with in the tribal societies, they're much more at peace. They're, they're not so stressed out. So it's the luxury we have here in the West. We pay a price for it. 
I mean, you know, as I as I said in the beginning, you know, this, the, the 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 big truths are the most like simple ones uh, sometimes, and it feels like, yeah, balance. Yeah, I heard it before. You know, balance. Yeah, balance is important, but it really is damn important. Like, it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, yeah, because honestly, I feel like the pendulum went from one extreme to the other very quickly in the Western society because now it's like this whole like be mindful and be aware of like the every single moment and then it's just like yeah. like what you describe offers like a very nice sort of like different perspective which is just like yes and we need you know we can learn from the past we can plan for the future also while live being in the moment. present. Yeah. 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 Well, this is saying, you know, learn from the past, plan for the future and live in the moment. Because the only reality that exists, the only is the present moment. That's just clear. The only thing right now that exists is this very moment. Everything else hasn't happened or already passed. So, so it, it, if you look at societies that never plan for the future or learn from the past, I've been to several of those. It's disastrous. A society which only lives for the future and doesn't learn from the past and doesn't live the moment is also not good. So anything we do in life, whatever it is, every extreme, in my personal opinion, is not good. It's mm. like that in the jungle. You see, if you look into nature, if you look really in how nature functions, you will find that. You will find that balance. You will not find anything extreme in nature. It's all balanced. So this is what they, for example... Uh, a good example, and every tiny little thing makes a difference. For example, I'll give you an example about frogs, right? Frogs. Right. So we have a specific type of frogs in the jungle. In the evening, they, they come out, beautiful orchestra of frogs chirping. Well, the sound of the frog awakens certain animals, certain insects that then come out of the ground. And from that moment on, it starts the entire cycle for the night. The insects come out, certain birds come feed off the insects, then they go to certain trees and it feeds and you have a whole incredible infrastructure that you have or ecological structure you have or cycle. Now, if these frogs one day decided to, you know, say, oh, we don't want to do it tonight, we're too lazy, no, we don't, you know, we decide that we're not going to, you know, come out at this time, what would happen? The entire balance of the jungle would fall apart. Now, we humans, and this is also something we tend to think that we're above it all, but we're not. We are a part of nature. And if we bring anything out of balance, then, you know, eventually everything else will fall. So maybe not right away, maybe not tomorrow. And I always say we need to learn to be part of the whole cycle of nature and that we have our place here in this world and that we have a responsibility not only towards nature, but also towards each other. And it is good, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those, and this is something that I often get heated about, or people don't agree, is that, you know, this whole concept of, oh, leave the people in jungle, let them live the way they were forever and everything. I'm totally against that because, you know, again, you don't bring, if there's no change, change is good. Change can also bring negativity, but it also brings positivity. So I always, I've always seen life, regardless of if it's nature or humans, as balance. And that has to do with the way we interact also with each other. Yeah. yeah. For those who give too much, don't give too much. For those who don't give at all, learn to give. Mm. Balance. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. My... Yeah, there's a lot happening uh, within me. And, and I'm reflecting back on, like, you know, how do I, how do I live? And, and, and something that, you know, comes to me is that. So I'm doing a lot of work with with in a space with men. So working with men and there's a lot of like time we spend in nature and a lot of grounding happening. And I feel like there is um, a lot of answers and, and questions that we have uh, in our society. And I certain I can only like I make a nice statement. I have a lot of questions, you know, about like, who am I? How do I want to be in the world? What's my purpose? How do I want to treat people how do i want to relate how do i want to live relationships what's my place all of that uh what are my values uh, all of that and um i feel like when when it comes to balance it's like so i i 
I ground myself and we do a lot of like primal calibration exercises. We do a lot of like, yeah, just being with nature and, and witnessing her. And from that, we, we, we learn and we sort of remember. So it's not like something that we learn like anew, but it's just like we remember actually what always has been there to some yeah. degree. And um, I find that very powerful. And then it's basically like, okay, nobody actually needs to tell me how to do certain things because then I know myself because the wisdom is already in me. But I have sort of like forgotten or like I, I've been distracted. So um, I would, and, and all that being said, I, I would love because I see that in our society and also we discussed it in the podcast like quite a few times. And that is the whole thing about like masculine and feminine, feminine energies, the role of women and men in society and all of that. There's a lot of like uh, extremes again. The pendulum went from one side completely to the other side. The other, yeah. And yeah. Um, so I would, I would be very um, curious to hear your um, experience um, with, with living in tribes. Um, and also when it comes to initiation, rituals and ceremonies into men or womanhood, um, what did you learn um, in, 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 these, in these kind of like aspects? So the tribe of life, is it has complete different structure in terms of yeah the, in terms of the whole structure of society is very different than here so you have right. to imagine it like one big structure and everybody is under this structure so um in order and you have to have it because otherwise you wouldn't survive that means in the jungle itself you do not have your own identity your identity is the tribe not yourself for example the fayu didn't have a word for me so if they spoke about themselves, they said, you know, I am, uh, Sabine is hungry or Sabine is sad or Sabine is happy. So, uh, which also is not so good because they lost their own identity. But the other thing is, is that inside the structure, there are very clear defined rules. You know, you have the men and their world, the women and their world. And in that world, they were also defined. Uh, from very early on, they would recognize, for example, a child had a certain talent. Uh, a child was very wild. Uh, so they would, you know, train to be a warrior or a hunter. A child was very quiet, liked to be by itself. So he became a fisher. Fisher. So they, they, according to the character of the child, the child would be put in a certain direction. And there was never any question of the child didn't grow up and say, Oh, I, I don't want to be a gardener anymore. I want to be, you know, a warrior. That just doesn't happen. You don't have the freedom in the tribal life. You do not have freedom, which I never realized because freedom. In a tribal society, in, in, in their, in their way of thinking, subconsciously means danger. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you're free, if you're out, if you're alone, you die. So now we come to this society where these, this one big structure is gone and everybody is a structure on their own, which means we have a lot more freedom to decide what we're going to do, what we want to become. And the whole, there's a whole, let's say, melting of people, of, you know, we have this now this whole gender issue and everything. And because we live in a complete different world where survival is completely different. So in the jungle, if you were to not to have this one big structure, the, the tribe would just disappear. They would die. They would disappear. They would be hungry. So they need that to survive. We are beings that adapt to our environment to survive. The, mm -hmm. Our emotions, our thoughts, everything is focused on how do we survive. We're not even aware of it. This happens in childhood. And I'll give you a good example. Now, when I have, as you know, I have children. They're all grown now, but I have four children. And they grew up in the West. Now, when we cross the street, my children are able to calculate within seconds in their brain, automatically, a car that's coming. They can calculate the distance and speed and they will automatically know, do I have enough time to cross the street? Mm -hmm. I don't have that. I never learned that. So every time, which, you know, we joke about it this day, I've been here in the West for many years, but to this day, when I cross the street, I'm nervous because I can't calculate that as fast. So my brain is trying to calculate it. And by the time it's calculated that the car's too close. Mm. So those are developments that happen in the brain in order to survive in a certain environment that we are in. And, but on the other hand, I do believe that all of us, there is, 
and I was speaking to to a young man yesterday. Well, young man, yeah, he's a he's a scientist, and he was explaining to me because I always thought you know ge- genetics to have have a role of you know, I always thought genetics was different depending on where you grew up. But he said no. He said genetically we're all the same. We're actually all the same. The thing is, where did you grow up? You know, where did you you where did you grow up? In what environment you grew up? Now, coming back to your original question, we are now in a time which we haven't had in known history with technology, with traveling. We have an incredible clash of cultures. We have people coming in from all over the world, living in this big melting pot. So we're going through an incredible change. How this change will look like in, let's say, 50 or 100 years, nobody really knows for sure. And in this change, you have these clashes of cultures of people who all of a sudden, like in a tribal you know, in the tribal world, your identity is your is your tribe. It doesn't matter even if you leave, even those that go to the West and get educated, you ask them, any Melanesian you ask them, they will identify with the tribe. We don't have that in the West anymore. So the whole question is is identity. And I think it's just it's a change. Every change, there's chaos. But I think eventually, I'm hoping, of course, that eventually we will find a new way to live in this world which is so completely different than before. And I think that's why there's so much things happen. That's why we go to the extreme. It, it's always like that. It's a pendulum. It goes from one extreme and then the other extreme. And then eventually, hopefully, it'll let balance out. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm really getting a, a sense when speaking with you about, and it's very, uh, like I'm learning, I'm learning a lot, which, which is definitely, you know, that the, the truth and, and wisdom is, is, is found in the middle. And like I said, you know, it's, it's really not about, applying different uh, concepts and and beliefs like Im- like directly and immediately uh onto another construct but what is something that we can extract that we can you know sprinkle into our daily lives that help us to live a more uh fulfilled life and you know you name beautiful examples of farming as well where you know the the the, the tribe the tribal people can learn from our ways of doing and, and vice versa. So um, I, and, and you spoke about, you spoke about motherhood uh, and, and, you know, your, your four children. Um, it's something that I, that I, that I wanted to ask you, what did motherhood in, in your life change, change for you and introduce into your life? Yeah. yeah, surprisingly not so much because I grew up in a society where it was absolutely normal. Like, like for example, it, it, having a child, I was very young. I mean, I was I, I had my first at 19, so I was really young. I, you know, in this world, in this society, in my opinion, too young. But for me, it, it, for me, there are, if someone asks me what life is about, because that's a big question, why are we in this world? Right. The two big questions, right? right? Or the big question. So for me, it's a very simple answer, which everyone would probably laugh, but it's simple. One reason is to ha- to continue our species. Right. It's in, and every person has it, you know, to continue the human mankind. So to have children. The other one is to leave the world in a better place or in a better way than we found it. So if right. everyone was born with that concept, we're going to leave the world better than we found it. I think. Yeah, I think that's a very good concept of, and that's the way I see life. Why are we here? Why are we alive? And, and, you know, of course, it's nice to do something for ourselves. It's nice to make ourselves happy. But at the same time, I've always said, I want to leave the world in a better place than I left it, or then I'm, then I'm going to leave it one day so that one day I die, I say, okay, I've done something good. I've left something good behind. And the other one is, of course, that to, you know, to continue our species, which, you know, is, is, is nice. And I, so for me, motherhood was very, was very rewarding. It was very, I always say if it hadn't been for my kids, I wouldn't have probably survived all that I did. Uh, or I would be somewhere deep, deep, deep in the jungle. <laughs> if I wouldn't have had kids, I would, I would be somewhere off in the jungle and who knows, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't my destiny. Right. And, um, yeah. So I find having kids for me was very easy. It was very natural. Mm-hmm. Very normal, very natural. I mean, in the context of you, um, so then chronologically, we, we, we are jumping a little bit forward. Um, you're coming back to Germany uh, after your time in, 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 in like the first sort of like, let's say, uh, life in the jungle, the first part of it. Um, and you start life here. 
um, and you integrate to the best of your abilities with everything that you have experienced. Yes. Yeah. And I um, then I you, tried. Yeah. <laughs> well, <I> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, ninety nine percent of the like hundred percent. I I don't know anyone who has experienced anything along the lines that you have. Mm -hmm. So we can only we can listen and we can feel into it, but. You know, as long as we have an experience, we won't know. So um, that's why so many people are listening to you and your story. And, and, and it's fascinating because it's so different to what we experienced. But um, but then you eventually start getting getting sick. You, you start, yes. you know, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, becoming ill and you decide to go back um, to the jungle. And to be honest, like in the preparation for this, um, to me, it made to me it made perfect sense intuitively. It yeah. was like, well, you know, if you look at your trajectory of life, where you are coming from, what you have experienced, coming in touch with a sickness and like that is so severe and like to, you know, that is potentially life threatening. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it makes absolute sense and every part of me is also as a even looking at it from the outside it's like i i feel like it would be definitely um good to go back to where you initially basically you know were i don't know raised to find ways of healing and healing is yeah. something that we talk about on this podcast so much um but i i guess in a question um, and what you shared about being a mom, I, 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 like how, how is that like that that decision that you have had to make prior to going back? I mean, wow. Yeah, that was, that was yeah, that was that was brutal. Um, so when I, I mean, you know, obviously when I start getting sick, this is over a number of years. Um, I began to look up every doctor. I mean, I tried. I mean, I, I once listed up, I could sit here for like, I don't know how many minutes listing up everything I tried, like every type of doctor, every type of treatment, everything, nothing helped. And I was just getting sicker and sicker and it was coming back every month, which in hindsight, they said was probably a parasite and they probably, they said we probably got it in the jungle. Right. So when I came to the point where they said there's nothing more you could do anymore and I was dying, I was very, very, very ill. I was, you know, I'm, I'm five, eight and I was like. 45 kilos. I don't know how many, how many pounds that is. So I was very, very much underweight. I couldn't eat. I was nauseous. I was in pain. I couldn't function like practically couldn't function anymore. And then when I was pretty much told that there was nothing more that could be done for me and I knew I had normal strength, I went home and I, and, and, you know, my older kids were already older, but my younger ones were, were fairly young still at the time. And so I always say if I hadn't had the ch kids, I would have accepted it. I would have accepted it and said, okay, you know, I had a very colorful life. It's my time to go. But then I thought to myself, I can't leave my kids. I can't, you know, what's going to happen to them? And and it, I always say that the love you have for your child is so powerful. It can make you do things that you never thought was possible or was humanly possible. And I thought, okay, you know, I have two possibilities. Either I stay here and I prepare my children for my death, or I grasp onto a tiny, tiny, tiny possibility. And that was, if I got it into the jungle, if this is something from the jungle, then maybe there's someone out there among the tribes who knows the disease, who knows what it is, and who knows how what the cure is. And I had no idea what would happen, but from a spur of a moment, I said, okay, that's my only chance. I have to do it. I have to take this only chance. And at least to try to save myself because, you know, it doesn't matter how old kid, children are, they always need their parents. So I made a heartbreaking decision, which I don't think I will ever really get over. I think it just, it just, it breaks you that decision. And I had to give my kids up to their father. And I went, I went back into the jungle and I thought, you know, maybe half a year or a year maybe. And then I would be back. And I said, this not comes together, I'll be back. And I, I ended up being gone for five years and didn't see them. And that was heartbreaking for me. But, you know, it, it, it's like, it's like someone, it's like a good example. Someone comes to you and gives you a lottery ticket and says, okay, you have fill out the lottery ticket. And if you don't get the right numbers, you're going to die. 
those are the chances I had. Practically impossible because we're talking about a disease no one knew, a huge, huge area, hundreds and hundreds of tribes, hundreds of, you know, um, hundreds of different, different, um, medicine, matter what we call it. And then trying to find that one person who knows what it is. And those were my chances. And I knew it at the time. So it was tough. Yeah. How, how, um, how was it during the time when you were in the jungle? Um, because as far as I remember, you told your children that you are going on a, on a project, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, so, yes, because, yeah. yeah, because I didn't want them, you know, which it, I'm really happy I made this decision. Um, of course, you know, the, your feelings tell you, you, you got to tell your children why you're going, you have to explain it to them so they don't yeah. think bad about you. Yeah. But I said to myself, imagine I tell my children, oh, by the way, I'm going to the jungle because I may, I, I'm, you know, I'm probably dying now and maybe I'll find a cure. My children would have, all of them would have been broken. Because they would have had to wake up every morning, not knowing is her mom alive and is she dead? And that would have destroyed them. So I decided to not tell anyone. I did not tell my family. I did not tell. I think one, one, two people knew, but nobody knew why I was going because I was afraid they would find out. So yeah, so they, they had no idea what, they, 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 they later on, they told me that they assumed it. I mean, they, they saw I was sick. So they assumed it, but they said they didn't want to face that reality. They would, they prefer to just think, oh, mom's off on the project. And how was it during the time when you were then gone? Uh, were you in, in recent contact with them to some degree? Like, how, I mean, you were in the jungle, so I guess, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, every once in a while, yes. I mean, every time I was, it, it, I was somewhere where there was an internet connection or something I did, did reach out. I did talk to them whenever I could, but there were times like, especially when we were in areas for months at a time where there was no electricity, I, I had no contact with them. So I would tell them, listen, I'm going to be gone for a while just to let them know. But it was, it was hard, but I mean, it was, it, it, the good thing about time is that it's sort of, sort of like, you, you know, the, the pain, you, you don't forget all of it. But if I think back about it, it was at times there were days where I just, I thought I couldn't survive another day. I mean, it was just, I felt like my heart was ripped into pieces over and over and over again. That's the way I felt. And it was really tough. And, but on the other hand, I had a goal, you know, I had a goal to get better, to get back to them. And that's what kept them driving me to the next village, the next, you know, the next medicine man, the next uh, tribe just kept on pushing me, pushing me, pushing me over and over again to make fun um how do you speak about it now with 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 them um and what do they say right now uh to that whole journey well when i when i came back i spent about two years with them so you were able to catch up on a lot of things and they they're they're very happy i mean they're, they're today they're like thank god you made that decision so they're actually quite happy about it. It was very difficult for them. And obviously it's, it's hard when the mom's gone, especially because I had a very close relationship with them. I mean, you know, so they, it was tough, but they said they would have preferred that than me staying for a little bit and then losing me forever. So I right. think that's a very logical conclusion that they came up with to say, you know, better lose our mom for five years than forever. And what would you say? Um, because yes, I mean, honestly, just, And this is also, again, something like I, I would consider myself an empathic being and, and I can, you know, I, I can try to feel into how that must feel. But my God, like I, I, I don't think I, I think it's just really unimaginable how hard that must be. Um, so now looking back at it, what did that time? What did yeah? What did you learn Uh, about yourself throughout this time and what do you take with you from that time so for me it, it it gave me a possibility that i didn't even realize i needed it gave me it gave me a time to grow up because i left the jungle when i was 17 right before i turned 18 and i was then caught so much i was caught in like this whirlwind of trying to adapt trying to understand a world where i looked like everyone else But I, there were just so many difficulties that I was faced, but I couldn't understand them. So on some levels, I never really had the chance to really grow up, like to mature properly. So when I went back into the culture that I knew and the culture that I had been raised in, 
for the first time, I was able to compare these two cultures because I've lived in the West. I, I grew up in the in a tribal system. I lived in the West. Then I returned to the tribal system, and it was like all of a sudden, I was able to see things so much more clear. I was able to understand what my difficulty was, why I was having difficulty integrating, what were the misconceptions that I had about the West. Because growing up in the jungle, you get taught, which is interesting, you always get taught, well, you know, the white man is educated. People don't like the word white man, but that's the way they do call people from outside. Even if you're Asian, they call you white man. So white right. man is, is, let me just clarify that for those who are listening, is just a term that is used in tribal setting with anybody who's a foreigner. So, you know, we had this concept of, oh, you know, the, the, the white men, they're all educated and they're smarter than we are. So that, there was like so many misconceptions or like the fact that I was very afraid of freedom. I had never learned to be free because I grew up in a system that was very structured and all of a sudden the structure was gone. And, you know, and I just, it was like I had no more floor under my feet. Um, I began to understand why I had so many difficulties communicating with people. I spoke the language, I speak several languages, and I speak them fluently. So why couldn't I communicate with the people here? And going back there and being in my setting that I, I had known in my childhood and youth all of a sudden made me understand all these, all these different aspects, which I'd never heard about. I mean, I've never, you know, read about them in a book. For example, the most simplest concept, probably the one that really changed everything was a concept that in order to survive in the jungle, you have to be invisible. In order to survive in the West, you have to become visible. Mm. Now, not meaning that you have to be seen or not seen, but it has to do with your identity. In a tribal system, you are invisible because you are part, you melt within the tribal system. You are just part, just part of the structure. And here, in order to survive, you have to become a structure. And I began to, I understood for the first time when I came back that I was free. I mean, it was such a strange, I'm like, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. I can make decisions. And, and that for me opened up an entire new world. So that which scared me before all of a sudden changed completely and that it became an opportunity. So that, so we tend to be very afraid of something we don't know. But when we know and understand it, it changes everything. But that was probably one of the biggest, of course, the fact that I'm healthy today and not dead. <laughs> of mm -hmm. course, that's the most important. But, but, you know, so that gave me a chance to really understand who I am. And it also gave me a chance to understand the different culture, different cultures between where I had grown up and in, in the Western culture. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating that. Um, and let me ask you a little bit even more specific from the second time you went back and also now um, about, you know, that's that's what the whole second book that you wrote, um, which, you know, I think it translates to I, I, I don't... I don't swim where the crocodiles are. Yeah, the English, the English, because I'm working on, I, mean, I wrote it in English, by the way, the original is in English. So right. I'm just going through it now and doing the changes. But yeah, the English is I don't swim where the crocodiles are. Right. So basically that, that circles around that, you know, that second time of you returning uh, due to your sickness to the jungle and just what you described, you know, um, the struggles that came along with that being separated from with your kids and completely unknowing, you know, now obviously in hindsight, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I, 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 I eventually found the, the cure and all that. But like I said, you know, I can just imagine the, how hard that was. So just looking at that part of your journey, um, and overcoming that those obstacles again and again and again, that inner resistance to you know uh, to overcoming this illness. Um, is there like a specific learning from that time that you carry with you? I'm looking for the for the cure. I did. I mean, I what I did which I never knew as a child was the incredible amount of <clears throat> medical knowledge or knowledge that the tribal people still have. And searching in a lot of it's being lost. Okay. But I was surprised. And like, for example, <clears throat> um, when I came there, I, they, they gave, they showed it to show me a bush. Cause I asked them, you had the, the, the question of malaria, right? So I asked them, you know, what did you do in the old days before you had malarone and all this, you know, Western medication? What did you do when you had malaria? And they said, well, we never hardly got malaria. And I said, well, why not? Oh, they said, because, you know, there's a bush. If you take it, then you don't get malaria. And I'm like, what? 
And, I, and they showed it to me and it's like just a shrub that grows and they explained to me how they used to use it in the old days. So I asked them and I'm looking at these people and I'm like, you know, and these are the same people, by the way, that are now using Western medication when they get malaria. So I asked them, why are you not using your traditional medicine? And they said, well, we were told that, you know, Western medicine is better. So I, by the way, and I did take it, by the way, and I never got malaria once, not once. So when I was there, so I understood that there's a lot of knowledge out there, but I also understood that there's a lot they don't know. I mean, we are, like I say, there's not, there's nothing a hundred percent in this world. There's always, well, almost not everything hundred percent in this world, but, um, there is, you know, just like I learned a lot about tribal medicine, which in many ways is good. I also know I've also, I saw a lot of suffering also, which in the West would be no problem to cure. So both have advantages and disadvantages. My case was a bit unusual in that I was dealing with uh, most probably a parasite, which is unknown in the West, which is not known. And that was, and in order to find it, and in order to find a cure would have taken years and I would not been able to wait that long. So, yeah. So I, I tend to look at things from a very realistic point of view where I don't like I don't believe in extremes. I don't believe in saying this is good or this is bad. I always try to look at both sides and see the positive aspects of both sides. Hmm. What are you scared of? Hmm. I'm scared that I won't fly anymore. And I'm not talking about an airplane. Um... Ever since I was a child, I've always, I've always been, someone would ask me what bravery was. What is bravery? Um, German would say mut. So what, what is brave? What is being brave? And for me, bravery means to fly. Freedom means to fly. I always wanted to be free. And my biggest fear is always that I would be put into a cage. That's always been my biggest, ever since I was a child, I've, I've always, and I'm not meaning freedom that I can do whatever I want, because that's also a misconception. Someone who says I can do whatever I want is not freedom. Um, it's like a good example is uh, take someone in, you know, on a rowboat, put them into the ocean. You know, you have beautiful weather, ocean completely, you know, still. The sun is shining. You're saying, oh, this is beautiful. You know, what do I need the oars for? So much work. And you throw the oars over there. Well, wait for a storm to come. Then you're in trouble. Whereas... You know, when you have the oars, you can navigate through life much better. It's a lot of work that you navigate. And for me, that's always been, yeah, I always see that as freedom and being able to navigate through life freely. So, yeah. I, I, I feel like this is very interesting that you say that because um, earlier when you were describing life in the community, in the tribe, uh, compared to where, you know, how we live in the West, you know, the, the aspect of freedom is defined in a very different way because you have to be like, there is, I mean, compared to the w way that we relate in the West to freedom is, is, is inexistent as I understood from you in the tribe, because as soon as you are embarking on a individual like journey into freedom you, yeah. you you're likely to die because yeah. <laughs> you don't survive so no, or, or you bring the whole whole tribe out of balance and then it's not so yeah yeah personal freedom is yeah it's very different i i i think personal freedom is very important but i also think that structures around that is very important because here you have the same thing. You can't, if too much freedom is not good, no freedom at all, by the way, is not good either because there are, there are, and I've seen this in societies where they had absolutely no freedom. These societies don't develop. Right. And they eventually they collapse. So I do believe, and, and that's something that, for example, I appreciate in the West is the personal freedom that one has here. The personal freedom to, to decide what you want to do, what you want to become. I mean, we have an incredible, we have opportunities here, which are a lot. But I noticed that many people are also overwhelmed by these opportunities. It's like, you know, like, for example, when I was a child, we would go to the store in Jaipura and we had a choice of two cereals, Weetabix and cornflakes. You know, those are the two choices Love we have. Weetabix, yeah. <laughs> yes, Weetabix and yeah. So we chose, you know, so it, it was a very, then we went, then we came to Europe and we went to the supermarket and they were like, 
30, 40, 50 different cereals. So on one hand, it's nice. But on the other hand, it's also overwhelming. So personal freedom, I think, is very important. But I also think that, you know, if you have to learn how to, you have to learn how to how to hand to hand it. You have to learn it. it you have to learn how to deal with it, because for, you know, freedom can also bring freedom brings with it also many many different options and many different choices, which can also be very overwhelming. Right, which you don't have in the tribe. You don't have just feeling overwhelmed because you know there's no choice. So you do you you have two choices and you, you stick to one of them. So it's a lot easier, but you don't have the possibility to develop like you do in the West. And that's one of the reasons in the West, I believe, why we are so developed as we are is because we do have that possibility to develop as an individual. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You will never have me say one extreme or the other because I, you know. I think every extreme is 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 complex with difficult. Yeah, well, I mean, Not so for exciting. sure. Like <laughs> my my takeaway already is definitely like fi finding balance. You know, that's 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 the biggest thing that I uh, definitely sort of already feel um, is is stepping away from from also this constant. Uh, intuit, like not, not, not uh, but reactive um, pattern of labeling things as good or bad, and and judging and 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 giving names and and making a pro con list or something. It's just like you know there is things that we can learn from each part of the spectrum, and we can integrate it to the best of our abilities into where we are and and yeah. and, and, and the infrastructure that we are in. Um, to and to do good with it, you know. Yeah. To do good with whatever. I, that's always what I, you know. It's, it's, I would say whatever you learn, learn it to do good. It's it's important to protect oneself. Yes, that's something. By the way, I didn't learn. It took me a long time to learn that. Uh, so protecting oneself is something you need to learn in the West, like emotionally, mentally, not mm. physically. No, physically we're we're very well set up here. And in the jungle, you have to learn to protect yourself physically, but you don't have to protect yourself emotionally or mentally. So. There you have again two extremes, both of them not really. So you know, it's good to have balance on that one too. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. Now I I change up the question because that's actually exactly something that I wanted to ask you as well, which is um, you said something along the lines of like that you know um, how you can you were speaking about a tribe lead and how um, basically the different like how you hurt someone in the, in the tribe community is entirely different to how we define hurting someone in in the west meaning you know yeah. you hurt someone in 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 a communal tribe um more with like f physically um that and and that is that is actually less less bad than when you hurt them emotionally or you take away their pride or you take away their yeah. status embarrass embarrass them exactly it's the worst thing you can do to someone in a trial it is like worse than you know shooting someone or hitting someone um yeah but it it yeah so yeah so that that because many people you know in my book i do i do get into a bit of a conflict with someone and you know many people were like here like shocked and and i i debated a long time whether to write it but we decided to go ahead and write it and so because for me it's like if i hear that like for my tribal way of thinking, if someone says, oh, you know, I, you beat each other up, I laugh about it. I don't take it serious. Right. But if someone insults another person, if someone embarrasses them, for me, like my heart stops. I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, you know, this is, this is going to get serious. So, but here it's the other way around. Here, if people like beat each other up, everybody's like, whoa. But if someone's like, you know, insulting or embarrassing someone else, nobody even looks. So there you have one of a very big, by the way, misconception or cultural misconception you often have between but, cultures. But it's beautiful. I mean, you know, outer, wo outer wounds, they can heal quicker than inner wounds can. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like... I, I, and I and I relate with that, and I mean we see it everywhere. You know, we see, yeah, we don't have physical harm, at least not like I mean now with war in within Europe. I mean it's coming potentially closer, yeah, but, but like yeah, but war um, is terrible. War is different. That's all killing people. You know, when it comes to killing, obviously that's that's totally not okay. That's something I find I find very odd. I think we're the only species that kills each other just for 
you know, for purposes. Like if you look at nature, something that I remember even as a child, like even like people ask me, because the fire where I grew up, they were in a very, very extreme war situation. They were in a blood war. That means they were killing each other off, like really, really brutally. And someone asked me why, you know, if I was traumatized from it. And I wasn't. I was never traumatized because as a child, children think very much in black and white. As a child, it makes sense. It was terrible, but it makes sense. I mean, I wasn't involved in it. That's probably why I wasn't traumatized. I never had to fear for my life. But, you know, they they were obviously, they struggled with it. But for me, looking at it as, as a child, for me, it was like, well, that's the, that's the enemy. So, you know, you're... Putting it in a very blunt way, your friends or your people around you, you protect with your life and your enemies, you take their lives. So for me, even though it wasn't good, it still made sense. Then I come here into the West and all of a sudden there's war going on. And all of a sudden I'm like, that doesn't really make sense because, you know, we go to war for power we go to war for land we go to for we are such as a species we are incredibly aggressive we are mm. very aggressive we're very advanced but we're very aggressive so that's what a lot of tribal people even tell me that which i always find very amusing when they say oh the, you know you you white people the white man is very aggressive they tell me very dangerous very aggressive not because we hurt them physically but because of the way people tend to go in there and tend to do things, which is also very much a cultural misunderstanding. Here you have a lot of cultural misunderstanding. So a lot of the work I did when I was there is actually talking to the people and explaining to them the culture here in the West. What is the culture like in the West? And then they were like, oh, now we understand. And that also changed the attitude as people coming in where I said, okay, you know, in that culture and the culture in the Western culture, it's okay to ask questions. You know, it's considered polite to ask questions. So, yeah, so that was one of the work we, used to, we did a lot in my travel. I mean, honestly, like something that's coming to me is like, be because like there seems to be like also like a subconscious like judgment of like, oh, okay, you know, the tribes, yeah. Um, actually, uh, Gregor Gysi was also asking you about that, you know, like, you know, you were fist fighting and stuff with a like physical confrontation going on in the tribes. And when, And I feel like subconsciously we sort of like look down on that a little bit. Ah, okay, you know, that's how they resolve conflict. But then when you really look at it, I feel like, you know, it might sometimes even be like the 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 like the more like sort of like the deeper way of like resolving conflict. Because I, when I'm looking out, it's just like, well, yeah, we don't do that. So we certainly don't like hurt each other physically then we hurt each other emotionally um and 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 sort of like on a more like subtle uh level but then that eventually as we see now in war manifests through like inner wounds that they express in some way of anger and frustration to a degree where then physical violence is being taken and released yeah. in completely like horrible ways so i'm like hmm potentially for some people it would have been better to get on a punching bag or to i don't know go go i don't know go in the wood and chop in the forest and chop wood or something like that to mm -hmm. release that because there's so much like internal wounding that requires healing on a on a on a on a deeper level before it manifests itself in a in a vicious evil way you know Yeah, but there's, I, I think that a lot of it, not a lot of it, some of it, I think is also misunderstandings. I, I come across that often in smaller scale, of course, but oftentimes we, for example, I'll give you a good example. So, um, someone comes into a tribal setting and right. a, especially if, if, let's say a society which doesn't have contact or much contact with the outside and they have their own laws, their own rules, their own way of doing things. Um, there are certain things that you don't, you're not allowed to do in a tribal setting. So someone comes from the outside and does something which they consider absolutely normal. And then all of a sudden they get, you know, they get into trouble, they get attacked or whatever, and they don't understand what's going on. So they go out and they go, you know, and say, oh, this tribe, they attacked me. And then this tribe gets punished for what they did. But if you look at the core of what happened is that this person went in there and, for example, you know, touched a woman. You're not supposed to touch women in, in tribes. So it goes in there and touches a woman. Or, for example, there's this one one society where 
you like if a woman gives you food, you like like if um like if you're a man and you're in there and a woman comes and gives you food, you don't look her in the eyes and you don't smile at her and you don't thank her. Because you do that, then the husband's sitting close by saying, Oh, he's flirting with my wife, I gotta get rid of the guy. So, you know, he's sitting there smiling at you at the same time he's like sharpening his his, his bush knife because he's gonna go after you while you're sleeping. Because for him it's like he's gonna take my my wife away from me. So, you know, so so sometimes it's like if you look, go way back and you look at the core of something, then oftentimes, you know, if you look at it, sometimes it's, it's also just cultural misunderstandings where someone, you know, the tribal person is is horrified that a man is going to come steal his wife. And the man is saying, well, I'm just being polite to this woman because she's giving me food. Right. So, and I've come across these situations so many times. And then they would, you know, the white person go out, they would go to the police. I was attacked by this tribal people. Then the police would go in, then they would punch the tribe. The tribe wouldn't know what's going on, that they would retaliate. And bang, you have this, you know, very, very difficult situation. I mean, there's like one situation that you share, which is, I think, like the story is like, uh, oh my God, you know, <laughs> no. with the, with the Amer <laughs> American scientists, I, know American I believe it is. Yeah, no, they were um, anthropologists. They right. came in, yeah, they came, yeah, that's, 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 yes, that, I mean, that is, it's, it's an extreme example, but it, it pretty much explains in really clear form what happens if you go into a culture and you don't understand it. Now, of course, that's the extreme case, but let's look at it in a smaller scale. Someone comes from another country into another country and they're programmed. I'm, 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 I'm a good example. So, you know, I was, I was programmed that I could, um, for example, um, when I first, when I first came here to, to boarding school in Switzerland, every person who would go past me, I would speak to them. I would greet them. And one of the girls said to me, she goes, wow, you know, you've made a lot of friends in the short time you've been here. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't know these people. And she goes, well, why are you greeting them? And I said, I have to greet them because if I don't greet them, they could attack me. And she's like, why would these strangers attack you? They don't even know you. And it goes back to when you're in the jungle because everybody knows everybody. You know, it's right. not like I had to, you know, it's, it's not, there's not that many people living in the jungle. So when you meet someone in the jungle, you have two options. It's, there's only two possibilities. You're an enemy or you're a friend. Right. There's no such thing as neutral. So I was taught if you don't greet someone, they're your enemy. So automatically in my way of my emotional way of thinking, I had to greet everyone that passed me because I had to make sure to let them know I'm a friend. So that's just a small, but now there's tons and tons and tons of different examples in that where you get confronted with cultural differences, which can often go to misunderstandings and which can escalate. And then, right. you know, you have a generational thing that goes on and on. So, yeah, so that was one yeah. of them. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> I already I already see the questions flying in regarding the uh, what we briefly touched upon. So, oh. <laughs> uh, okay. do, 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 can you maybe elaborate and like uh, briefly what what happened there in this sure. extreme more extreme example? Yeah, sure. So there was this um, anthropological couple who came in, and they wanted to go work with a like a tribe or a village that was up in the mountain regions. And they were told not to go there because there was, they knew, you know, th th this, this group belonged to a larger, um, language group. So if you look at, you know, Papua New Guinea was Papua, the island of New Guinea, you have like one language group, but there's many different tribes in that one language group. And that was the case on this one. So they, they were warned not to go up there because they hadn't quite you know, checked out what the culture was in this tribe. Like my, like my parents, they had training before. So they knew, okay, we got to be careful with this and this and this. Well, they said, no, we're anthropologists. We know what we're doing. And it was a, a couple who then went up there against the advice of everyone. And then they, there was the missionaries who told them don't go, but they went anyway. And the missionaries said to them, listen, before you go, at least take a ham radio with you that if there's an emergency, you can contact us. So they did that. They went up there. They built a house. A few weeks later, a few months later, I'm not quite sure how long it was. The over the you know short wave ram ha ham radio, there became the urgent screaming and crying of this woman, and she was screaming, "Help me, help me, help me! You've got to come save me! They killed my husband." So they got together the emergency team. They went up there, and some uh, there was a man, local man who spoke the language. And when he went up there, he said that you know there was the wooden house where the couple was living. The door was shut. Outside on the front was the husband dead on the floor. Next to him was standing the chief. And his men. 
And they were completely confused. So when the, when this translator came up to them and said, what happened? The chief said to them, I don't know what's going on here. The woman won't open the door. She's screaming and screaming, but I only did what she told me to do. So in what, after some investigation, what they found out was that in this tribe, in this culture, if a woman always smiles at a man, a married woman always smiles, oh, unmarried, married woman always smiles at a man and serves him food, it means that she wants him as a husband. Now, the, this American woman, obviously coming from the West, wanted to show respect to the chief, wanted to, you know, show appreciation, wanted to be friendly with him, and always smiled at him. And gave him food. So the chief found himself in a very difficult position because he said, I don't want this woman. I don't want her as a wife because, you know, another misunderstanding is that we think that we look nice because they, we, we're, for a couple of people, by the way, we're colorless. We're not white. We're colorless. Right. So they don't always think us as beautiful as we think we are. <laughs> so, you know, he was like, I don't even want this woman. She's way too skinny. You know, I don't find her attractive. But what was I to do? Because I had to, I had to, I had to protect my honor. Because the whole village saw what he was doing. Everyone saw that she was smiling at him continually. So he knew in, in his subconscious mind, if I don't do something about it, people are not going to respect me anymore. And he could bring the whole ba- the tribal system out of balance and it could all collapse. So for him, his only choice was, you know, to kill the husband. Generally in that culture, you either talk to the husband, you find an agreement or you kill him. But because they didn't speak the language, they couldn't communicate. So you kill the husband. So. That's what happens when, yeah, misunderstandings come. And this, this, and this one, they actually kept it secret because they were afraid that they, that the child would be killed out of, you know, revenge for the killing of this white man. But I wanted to ask you, yeah, I wanted to have asked yeah. you that because I was like, uh, it would have been absolute, like in that thing, it would, would be a very like moral dilemma. And I think, like my personal opinion, it would be utterly wrong to then go in from the outside as a, like mm-hmm. and apply our Western values and basically say like you know we are right and they are wrong because like obviously they operate just from a different value system and, and different moral codex, you know. And we, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so and their whole their whole emotional structure, like their whole emotional world is completely different than ours so what for us is completely normal is insulting for them that goes all the way to asking questions how you communicate you know someone asked me well if you can't ask questions how do you communicate and i said well because tribal life is based on giving and taking everything's giving and taking so if you want information you have to give information and then i explain how the way you do it how you do it how you get information so if you walk in there which often happens is that's why they always think that the white man is aggressive and rude is because you know a reporter goes in and starts asking first of all they want to see the chief um which you don't do you don't go in there and demand you know ask to see the chief he will come when he's ready um and the first thing you do is you start asking lots of questions which for them is very insulting because it means you don't it's, it's a lack of trust when you ask them a question it means you don't trust them so I have the, I had the same when I came where I have still have this sometimes to this day when it's too extreme, not, not in journalists and not in interview settings, but if someone comes and start asking me details, it, it drives me like I get really offended. Like if someone said, which maybe they're even right to ask the details, but I know that often over the years and I couldn't understand why. Why do I feel so offended because someone's asking me details about, let's say I'm doing a project and they start asking me all these details. Right. And yeah, it makes me angry. So, so that, that is something I, I, I also come across often is that these, even these very small differences can have an incredible impact on, on the way you react or the way we feel to put someone. And that's when the cultural misunderstandings start. And what do you feel like can we do to, to better that and to navigate it in a better way? I think by just being aware of it. Because awareness, I mean, everything starts with the awareness of something. Like right. the, when I became aware of it, I, I could deal with it much better. And I know that when these feelings come up, because feelings are very, I always say feelings are very unloyal. Because, you know, think about it. One, we always laugh, especially, you know, us ladies. You wake <laughs> up one morning and you think, oh, I look so great today. And then you wake up the next morning and think, oh, I look horrible today. You know, you're still the same as you were yesterday, but it's like the way you feel that morning is how you perceive yourself. So 
And that's the same with when I come across situations like with asking questions, I this feeling comes up of negative feelings come up and I have to tell myself, okay, these are just feelings. It's just a reaction to something and it's not the way it is. So already the awareness that there are different cultures that people react different, that before before responding to a situation, think about it. Try to figure out what is the background to it. You know, could this person be different because it comes from he or she comes from a different culture or, you know, has a different understanding of how you communicate, how you react to certain situations. So I think that awareness does a lot already. Right. How would you describe your relationship to spirit or to the divine or to God, whatever name you want to give it? Well, I've, I'm, I, I do believe in God out of a very simple reason. Nobody knows for sure, right? Let's say nobody knows. We, nobody knows for sure. A hundred percent. Scientifically, we don't know for sure. So if I have a choice between living in a world where I think there's no God and when I die, that's it forever and ever, ever. Or do I go through life believing in God, believing that there's something there and that, you know, life doesn't end when I die? It's a simple choice. And it's much nicer to believe that there's more than just this life out there, to believe that there's something bigger than we are, than to go through life thinking there's nothing after this. So it was just, that was my logic of saying, I do want to believe in a God and I think it's much, it's, it's, it's nice. And everybody has different ways. I'm also, I also don't believe in trying to push one's ways onto other people. I think everyone has a right to decide for themselves how they want to believe, what they want to believe, as long as it doesn't harm other people. Right. I've, uh, so as we, as we wrap things up, I have, um, couple of um couple of questions that i regularly ask my guests and uh to be honest like in 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 this in this container here i'm like particularly interested in how how you how you look at them um what do you feel like we need more of in this world sincerity Being sincere, doesn't matter what we do. I think sincerity. Because right. a lot of friendly people out there, you know, there's a lot, a lot. You go to cultures and in Japan, I lived in Japan, I love it. People are incredibly, like, polite and nice. But the question is, how sincere is it? Mm. Yeah, I love that. Polite. All right. Which is good too, by the way. I do. Prefer, <laughs> I definitely prefer people that are polite. I, I love living in Japan. I miss it to this day. Um, yeah, I, right. I love the politeness. But question. But I think sincerity would be good to me. Mm. And what do we need less of? Judgmental. Judgmentalness is not a word, but being judgmental. Criticism. Criticism. Positive criticism is good. Being judgmental. Judging other people. I think that is, in my opinion, the most destructive attribute that we have. We are so judgmental. And I come, I, you know, I grew up in a society where people weren't judgmental because, you know, there's not enough people to be judgmental about because you got to get along with everyone because if you're stuck with these people, you know, you're stuck with people in a tribal setting, you know, and get along with them. But I often come across situations here where, you know, someone will say, you know, like, it doesn't even occur to me sometimes to like, you know, even if I don't agree with someone or I just don't think it's, you know, something that I would do or prefer, it doesn't even occur to me to criticize that person or to criticize them, you know, negatively criticism or to say, oh, that's so, you know, embarrassing what that person did or that's so stupid or whatever. I don't, I just... It's one of the things that I always struggle with here in, this, in the rest of society is the judgmentalness. And that's something I think we would do much better with that. Mm. It's good to be critical, by the way. It's good to be careful. It's good to be critical in a positive way. You know, you should believe everything everyone says and all that. But I just think there's a line between, you know, not agreeing to someone or judging someone for that belief that they have with the actions that they do. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's 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 very like it's tied to the intention behind why you are reacting in any way to someone or something, you know, what is the intention behind it? and I feel like with B 
being ju judgmental, the intention is coming from a place of wounding and it doesn't really have any productive outcome. Whereas, you know, with positive, you know, or with negative, like with critical thinking, like the intention is, you know, what can we learn from that and what can the other person potentially learn from me critically reflecting that back, you know? So I feel like the intention behind it is also very, can be very powerful or like is maybe, you know? Yeah. yeah, but that's critical thinking or being, you know, critical in a, in a constructive way is good. But what I, what I've experienced often is that being judgmental, we actually learn that from our parents. Think about it. Because I was I always wondered why. And like for example, my kids I always wondered my children grew up in the West and they are so not judgmental. Like sometimes I'm I would say I'm be good if they were, you know, a bit more careful. But <laughs> so and I began to wonder why. And then I, I I remember watching other mothers. Think about it. You have a child, you have children pick up, children will imitate the parents. They mm -hmm. will imitate them. Yeah. So you have a three year old, four year old child being held by the mother and is talking to a friend or a neighbor and If you if you would record that conversation between the neighbor or the friend, you'd be amazed if if you were to replay that to the mother and say, "Do you understand what you just said? That your child picked up everything you said." I tell you, they would be shocked. So you have a lot. Oftentimes, you'll have like parents talk in front of the kids without realizing because the kids are playing or standing next to them. And then what do they say? Oh, did you see? You know that neighbor got this new card. Yeah, he's probably you know in some doing some like you know illegal stuff or like the criticism that comes, the judgmentalness. Children pick that up. So what happens? They learn that. They learn that from the parents, and they grow up and they do the same thing. So I said, you want to stop it? Stop being judgmental when the kids are around them because your kids will pick it up. Mm. Plus Amen. everything else is bad. <laughs> yeah. Kids pick up so much. And so I said, don't think twice before you talk in front of your kids. You know, there are, but then there's other aspects that society does not talk to the kids about, which I don't think is good, which is death, for example. That's another very interesting topic. Uh, how do you deal with death here is very different than how you deal with death in the jungle. And we tend to always want to protect the kids, which is on one side, I understand it. But on the other side, I also think that if you make something too taboo or too distant, then yep. it becomes scary. Whereas if it's something that is becomes, it's a normal process of life. You, everyone who gets born, everyone will die. Everyone. None of us are going to live forever. So I always think it's good to be very open about it. Right. And that is what you experienced in the jungle? Yes, yes, absolutely. Death is seen. I mean, they die a lot quicker than we do here. We, right. we, we do have a very good system, a medical system, where we don't die as fast. But um, death is considered no, but death. But the thing about death, and I think that's the reason like, I'm not afraid of death, or many people aren't that I know of in travel settings. Nobody wants to die, obviously, but they're not as afraid as here. So I think it has to do with that. For them, death is not the end. I've never met someone from a tribal setting who's not spiritual in one form or the other. It doesn't exist. So my understanding, I and mean, if someone could say and say, no, that's not true, there is a tribe that believes it could be, but I'm just talking from my own experience. Right. So um, they all believe that something happens to you after you die, even if they're not sure. Like the fire, you weren't sure either, but they all believed in life after death. And most of them, a lot of them believe that you just, you become like a spirit ancestor. And you remain there. So your status in life actually goes up after you die. Right. So, you know, obviously you're sad when a person dies and cry over them. But after that mourning period is over, it's over. You don't have, I mean, you know, you don't have people crying two, three, four years later about someone who died. It just, I've never come across it. They cry for a certain amount of time. They mourn. It's a big party, by the way. Funerals are big celebration. Right. Births and weddings aren't. But funerals is a huge, huge aspect. Why? Because it's like, you're helping the spirit go into the afterlife or the soul go into the afterlife and then life continues for that soul they're in a different place and life continues on this so what do you believe happens after you die um i do believe in definitely in in life after death i mean i've nearly died twice in my life like really really half dead twice so i have experienced the out of out of body phenomena Uh, I do believe in the afterlife and I do believe in reincarnation. It's just very unusual because I grew up in a Christian home, but I do believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. I like that thought. Beautiful. I always try to imagine what I was before. <laughs> I think it's a nice thought, yeah. We won't know for sure anyway, but it's a nice thought to have, so I, I, I do like to believe in yeah.
Well, I feel like you're a, a, a very old soul having, <laughs> you know, <laughs> coming I don't know. down I don't for feel multiple it. times already. Yeah, I don't know. My kids tell me I'm like, I, I'll never grow up. My kids always tell me, mom, you'll never grow up. <laughs> Which is yeah. true. I probably yeah, there's different it. layers to it. Yeah, you know, some sort of like, you know, young, youngish, childish sort of, you know, spirit within us. It, it, it's good, you know, to not take ourselves too serious, I feel like at times. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah. But I also think it's because I grew up in a world where, where I didn't have access to a lot of stuff. So when I got older, it's like, for example, I love video games, which, you know, I mean, oh, there wow. may be other people who like it, but I love it. Yeah, totally. So, you know, so I do these like, you know, I always have like, you know, like I'm, which, which I always call my kids. Like, okay. Okay. What's the next game? You know, and then I go online and I have my daughter lives, my Amazon lives in Canada. I'm like, okay. Okay. We're going to be online and you're going to be this. And I'm going to be this warrior and we're going to go to war together, <laughs> which is, which is like, I don't know of any mother. There could be mothers out there that do that. I don't know. Or I love animated films. So, and then my kids got older and then they wouldn't go with me anymore. And then I used to look around to my friends who's got a kid who wants to go to the movie with me and watch some animated movie that came out. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's a very childlike aspect about me. Right. Which is good. You know, I don't mind. I think it's fun. All right. Let's wrap it up with the last question. And that is, um, what are you looking forward to? Growing old. I look forward to growing old. Mm. Because it's, it's yeah, because I think I've had such a chaotic life. And I, I like the idea of growing old with someone of like, you know, wake. It just for me, it's just such a nice thought of looking back and, you know, having the wisdom now that you don't have when you're young of having a coffee in the morning with your significant other of, you know, just talking about life, just having, having a quiet, peaceful life when you're old. Because when you're young, you're too busy. you got too much to do. you got to raise kids. They're loud. They're messy. You know, it's, oh, I love kids, but they're a lot of work. I look forward to having grandkids. I think that's why also I'm like begging my kids for grandkids and they should have provided me some a long time ago and they still haven't, so... Yeah, no, I, I look forward to going that day. Well, I am not that young, and you got that going. Retiring, going. Yeah. I'll, I'll never retire in that sense, but. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I deeply appreciate you. I appreciate you that you we were talking about courage and bravery. Uh, uh, I, I applaud you for for sharing what you what you were sharing in this conversation and beyond. And I, I feel honored to have to spend time with you in that capacity it doesn't go unnoticed and it's certainly not taken for granted so uh, I deeply appreciate you thank you Sabine thank you thank you for taking the time hey beautiful listener you have made it all the way through and I want to take a moment to say thank you and you can do me an enormous favor it's all I'm gonna ever ask from you and that is to go to your podcast app right now and if you enjoyed the episode give the podcast a five star rating if you want to write one two words or sentences even more powerful even better um, thank you yeah already in advance and also while you're at it just click on that follow button on that bell notification so that you never miss a new episode all of that just contributes and it helps me to increase the reach of the podcast. That means I can attract bigger guests and that means I can deliver more powerful episodes. So the tiny thing, I'm only going to ask this little favor of you ever, not more, 10, 15 seconds of your time, a couple of clicks, that's it. Makes a huge difference for me as a creator. So thank you so much.